rotting. The farm near our house had a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin patch on Halloween. It's pretty cool to look at. A whole field filled with meticulously carved pumpkins with their grotesque faces glowing from the candlelight within. There was candy strewn about in little baggies, and kids of all ages visited either before or after they trick-or-treated to get some extra loot. We moved in across the street from that field a couple years ago. At first, we loved the idea of the jack-o'-lantern patch. It looked quite haunting and really spoke to the Halloween spirit in me and my wife. But when Halloween was over, the farmer didn't take the jack-o'-lanterns away, he left them to rot. I assume it was to fertilize the ground for whatever crop he'd plant in the spring. It made sense, he wouldn't want all that organic material to go to waste. But the problem was, that they'd attract animals. Animals and bugs. In the unseasonably warm November we had last year, the smell of the rotting gourds brought critters from far and wide to the field. When they were done eating, they'd wander to the neighbors. And being a small town, there was little anyone could do for the farmer, his name was Reuben, and doing what he wanted on his property. He had to deal with the deer and skunks and coyotes and foxes and flies and bees and bats and all eating and shitting and fucking their way across the town until no more pumpkins were left. And last year, I approached Reuben while he was setting up the jack-o'-lanterns. He was a friendly guy and there was never any doubting that. I explained the issue and he listened and he nodded. He said a few other people had told him the same thing. And he'd fix the fences over the summer so that wouldn't be a problem anymore. Besides, he told me with a smile, last year was just a test run. This Halloween, everything's going to be just perfect. On Halloween, the jack-o'-lantern field looked even better than it had the year before, even though the arrangement was the same. Reuben had hired some artists to collaborate and create some truly monstrous designs for the pumpkins. They were awesome. I even did a walkthrough by myself in the early afternoon before the candles were lit just to take it all in. Felt like a kid again. As the evening was coming to a close, and we'd given out the majority of all of our candy to the neighborhood children, we were getting ready to turn off the light and lock up when we heard sirens approaching. I looked outside and I saw a procession of police cars, fire engines, and ambulances. All of them heading towards us. I stepped out on the porch and I watched as they passed by our house, took that sharp left into the driveway of Reuben's farmhouse. I, I sat on the steps of my wife and watched as the lights were flipped on and the field was partially illuminated. Oh my god, I whispered. In the harsh overhead lights I saw bodies on the ground, among the glowing jack-o'-lantern small ones, small, costume ones. Kids. Oh my god, I repeated louder. Paramedics and rescue officials descended on the field and worked to resuscitate the still bodies. One by one, they gave up. The parents were arriving in droves, and the sound of wailing and hysteria filled the air. My wife and I held one another as little bodies with sheets over them were loaded into ambulances. The next morning, it was all over the news. Thirty-two children died in an apparent poisoning. Reuben was arrested and questioned. He refused to speak to the investigators. He was held without bail. Funerals were held, and the pumpkins began to rot. It was another unreasonably warm November, and on cue, insects began to discover the field. Clouds of flies drifted in and out, blanketing the field in a gray haze as they left their eggs in the pumpkin's softening flesh. In the following days, toxicology reports on the autopsy children came back. Whatever had poisoned him was still unknown. They had exhibited all the outward signs of a poisoning. Cyanosis, hemorrhage, paralysis, etc. But no toxins were found in their bodies. Tissue samples were held for further testing, but the corpses were released to the families. And two weeks later, the air was still thick with flies and bees. We hadn't had a frost, and, and things that crawled and flew feasted on the pulpy remains of the jack-o'-lanterns. From the house, I could see their deformed, hideous faces, faces which no longer evoked a feeling of holiday fun. They were faces that mocked the dead. But the incredibly warm autumn continued, 20 degrees above average, according to the weatherman. Flowers were blooming, 
Cherry trees had blossoms at full five months ahead of time. Pumpkins were still there, but mostly formless, having succumbed to the rot and ravenousness of vermin. As the hot November slouched into December, the luckiest of us had started to forget about the tragedy that had befallen the town. We still got reminders, especially on December 2nd, when Reuben broke his silence. Yeah, my cousin Ron works for the police department as a mechanic. He doesn't have any access to criminals or uh, official information, but he, he talks to the cops a lot. The cops like to talk. Ron came over on the second before any news had gotten out about what Reuben was saying. It was clear he was uncomfortable. Lillian and I sat and listened while Ron relayed what his buddy had learned from the detective. The Reuben I knew was nothing like the man being described by my cousin. He'd blanketed himself with cuts and scars and of indecipherable symbols and words. Every inch of his flesh was carved and mutilated in one way or another, something he'd done with his fingernails over the course of time that he was in jail. The detectives learned that Reuben was ready to talk when he began to scream the names of each dead child. But just after midnight on the second, he shouted each first, middle, and last name until his voice was hoarse. Detectives stood on the other side of his cell and transcribed what he said. They didn't understand most of it. It was better than nothing. The main takeaway was a date and time. December 5th, 11pm. No one could figure out what he meant by it. So there was a lot of speculation. All the police could do was park a unit over by the farm overnight just in case he had something planned on the 5th. And on that day, I sat with Lillian and Ron on the front porch and stared at that black field in front of us. Eleven came. Nothing happened. We waited for a few minutes. I saw the cop across the street standing next to his car, smoking a cigarette. As we were getting ready to go inside, I saw something flickering in that field. A tiny flame. Look, I told the others and I pointed. They saw it too. More flickers came into view. Hey! I yelled at the cop. He kept pointing at the field. The cop snuffed out his cigarette and walked around the barn to take a good look. Got to the side of the field and then raised his radio to call for backup. As we watched, the flickers intensified as if they were from new candles. They'd finally started properly burning their wicks after sputtering and threatening to go out. And after a couple of minutes, more police cars arrived. I got up. I started to cross the street. I needed to see what was going on. Don't. Lillian. And she grabbed my hand, but I shrugged her off and I headed towards that fence. I heard Ron walking behind me. The police arrived and lit up the field with their searchlights. We could see the rotten pumpkins sitting in that field, all with single candles sticking out of them. They were shaking one by one. Candles fell and hit the dry straw. The straw ignited. The police officers called for emergency assistance from the fire department. There was no, no chance They'd get there in time. The fire began to rage. Entombed in flame, the rotten pumpkin started to burst. Only after their pulpy bodies had disintegrated did they, did they see what was inside. Oh my god. Ron half whispered, half prayed. In the place of each pumpkin, there was a small, human-shaped thing sitting with its head down and its knees clutched to its chest. The heat intensified further, and I backed up, but I still saw it all. One by one, the things rose on sturdy legs, and they stood erect, they were growing, and soon they reached the size of the children who died. Their skin began to char, they walked out of the flames towards the crowd of police officers without any idea what to do, but terrified out of their minds, some began to shoot, the bullets didn't stomp them. Round after round tore through that fire spawn children, exiting their backs and legs and heads in a geyser of gore, but they walked ever forward. Soon the officers who'd fired fell to the ground. They didn't move for a second, but they just started to rot, just like the pumpkins. Other officers backed away. I, I backed away all the way up to my house. I watched from that doorway with my wife and my cousin. We were horrified. A procession of children walked down the street, followed by the police cars. Firefighters worked to put out that blazing field in it. 
After a little while, they, it succeeded. Ron turned on his police scanner and we sat in the living room, listening with horror as news of dead cops and other officials came in. The children have reached the prison. The children have burned through the cell of Reuben Rendell. The children are carrying Rendell back the way they came. Fuck, I said, and opened the front door. They were coming back down the street, a procession of black and smoldering kids carrying a burning man, Reuben, and he was screaming, It's almost done! It's almost finished! He screamed with peals of hysterical laughter as he burned. My children carried him to the field and placed him in the center, and they placed themselves in that same spot as the pumpkins from which they'd emerged. Most had gone out. Well, some still glowed with dull red fire, and before Reuben burned to death, he unleashed one final scream. Please accept this offering! Is this enough? Is this what you needed? See me through! See. Me. Through. There were no sounds from him after that final word. Nothing but the crackling of dying flame. The following days were a whirlwind of investigations, media visits, and speculation. No one knew what happened. No one knew what Reuben had done, and for a while, it was still a mystery how the kids had been poisoned in the first place. A mystery, that is, until Jasmine McRae, the mother of a child who was fortunate enough to have been too sick to trick-or-treat, found a small letter in her son's toy chest. It read, For a special night of Halloween fun, draw this little picture on a piece of paper and swallow it. Then come to Farmer Reuben's pumpkin patch to trick or treat. You'll never, ever, want to leave. The picture was of an inverted star, a pentagram. Jasmine's son told her Reuben had given them to kids at recess one day after he talked to the classes about what it was like to be a farmer. He came to them individually and made them promise to throw it away after they read it and not tell their parents. Jasmine gave the letter to the police, and then told the media, while the superstitious residents of the town took that as an answer to what had happened. Skeptics like myself couldn't believe it. Even after what I'd seen, I couldn't believe that something supernatural had occurred. But then the photographs came in. The aerial photographs from the news helicopters the day after the Holocaust at the field. Clearly marked in carbon and ash with the shape of a pentagram, the exact shape the pumpkins had been arranged in. No one had noticed it from the ground. And at the center of that pentagram, where Reuben had screamed his final pleading prayer, four words were burnt into the dirt. The answer to the old farmer's prayers. Not enough. Never enough. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. Just wanted to say thanks so much for listening. You guys are what makes this channel worthwhile. There'll be new horror stories every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday night, as well as gaming live streams every Friday and Sunday night. Please help support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and you can hear me as well as many other creepypasta narrators live 24-7 at scrmradio.com. Sweet dreams. <laughs>